The Return of the Latter Rain, Chapter 13, Faulty Guideposts, The Solemn Responsibility Resting Upon Those in Leadership Positions. In 1884, the Review and Herald began printing a monthly periodical called the Bible Reading Gazette, which contained Bible studies written by many different ministers and lay evangelists. At the end of the year, the 12 volumes contained a total of 162 lessons, which were bound in book form and sold by coal porters around the country with a large degree of success. As a result, the review prepared a similar series of studies, again written by various authors and sold under the name Bible Readings for the Home Circle. In the first edition, published in 1888 under the section The Two Covenants, 28 questions and answers eloquently expressed the views held by Uriah Smith, G.I. Butler, and others, including their definition of the Old Covenant and the idea of two dispensations. At the 1888 General Conference, E.J. Wagner and several others were asked to prepare new Bible readings. Wagner prepared a new reading on the subject of the covenants and submitted it to the Review and Herald Publishing Board. Interestingly enough, his new reading was accepted and placed in the new 1889 edition, circulating it by the tens of thousands everywhere. The new edition still had 28 questions and answers, but they were very different from the previous edition. Wagner had removed the idea of the two dispensations and made it clear that the Old Covenant was based upon the promises of the people to make themselves righteous. He also removed the concluding statement of the 1888 edition, quote, When we partake of the bread and wine, to what do we pledge ourselves? To be true to our covenant relation with God. Close quote. Wagner did not speak against entering into a covenant with God, only that it be the new covenant based on faith and not on man's promises. In the spring of 1889, E.J. Wagner was asked to finish writing the Senior Sabbath School Quarterly on the Book of Hebrews, which would run for three quarters, October 1889 through June 1890. His father, J.H. Wagner, had not completed the task before his death in April 1889. Because some of the original lessons have been lost, and because E.J. Wagner did not agree with his father on some of the ideas concerning the covenants, he rewrote five or six of the lessons, having been given the freedom to write his own views instead. The book of Hebrews having much to do with the sanctuary and the covenants, afforded Wagner an opportunity to write out more fully his views on the subject. When Wagner finished, the lessons were hastily sent to the different editorial committee members for critique. Unfortunately, Uriah Smith's name had been accidentally left off the list of committee members. To atone for the mistake, C.H. Jones, manager of the Pacific Press, sent a set of lessons to Smith with all the changes and additions. But Smith, seeing the name of J.H. Wagner in the introduction to the lessons, passed them on for publication, not noticing C.H. Jones's explanation of the changes and additions that E.J. Wagner had made to the lessons for the first and second quarter of 1890. This oversight, perhaps providential, would cause Smith a great deal of trouble and add to the controversy that soon followed. By January 11, 1890, the Sabbath school lessons had progressed to Hebrews chapter 8, where Paul writes of the new covenant in connection with Christ and his priestly ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. 
As church members around the country opened their new Sabbath school lessons, they found Wagner's teaching on the covenants. For many in Battle Creek, this was not a welcomed sight. For Dan Jones, Sabbath school teacher at the Battle Creek Tabernacle and school board member overseeing the Ministerial Institute, this was cause for concern. Upon seeing the new lessons, which had a good deal in them that I could not endorse on the subject of the covenant questions, Dan Jones resigned as teacher in the Sabbath school and stayed away from the ministerial school a couple of weeks. Others followed Dan Jones's example, some staying away from the ministerial institute where Wagner was teaching and others making objections during Sabbath school class. But this was only the beginning of trouble for Wagner announced on Friday, January 17, that he would take up the covenant question the next Monday morning during one of his classes at the ministerial institute. When Dan Jones caught wind of Wagner's plans, he set out immediately to try to stop them. Underhanded dealings. Although many have never heard of Dan Jones, he was perhaps one of the most influential men in the Adventist church during the late 1800s. Jones held many job titles, including Secretary of the General Conference, member of the powerful General Conference Executive Committee, one of the General Conference Association Trustees, Vice President of the International Track Society, Vice President and Executive Committee member for the National Religious Liberty Association, Chairman of the Committee of 21 formed at the 1889 Conference, and a member of many other subcommittees. Unfortunately, he used his position of authority to influence others in opposition to both Jones and Wagner. During the Ministerial Institute, he was in continual correspondence with other church leaders on the various committees seeking support for his plan of action. Dan Jones was so concerned over Wagner's views on the covenants that he would later write, quote, I have been worrying and fretting over this thing until it has hurt me worse than a half a year's work, close quote. In order to understand why this was the case, we need to understand a few facts about the Adventist church at that time. Church membership worldwide was just slightly over 28,000, of which nearly 26,000 lived in the United States. Only 207 ordained ministers and 158 licensed ministers labored for the 895 churches scattered across the country. Of these 365 laborers, the majority held responsibilities on the local conference and or general conference level as well. Since the first Adventist college at Battle Creek had not been established until 1875, most laborers had not received any formal ministerial training. Most had come from various backgrounds, professions, businesses, the workbench, and the farm, and had not had an opportunity for more education. Of those who had attended Adventist colleges, Few had received any specific or substantial ministerial training. For instance, none of the contemporary Adventist schools offered anything in the way of systematic theological study. Up until 1888, for example, the only Bible study classes scheduled at Battle Creek College were a ninth and 10th grade class in Old and New Testament history and a two-term, twice-weekly lecture by Uriah Smith on church doctrines. Attendance was purely voluntarily. In an attempt to revise Adventist education, W. W. Prescott, educational secretary and president of Battle Creek College, had devised the plan 
for the ministerial institutes to be entirely separate from the college for the specific purpose of giving further education to those ministers already in the field. The curriculum featured Christian evidences, church history, Greek, Hebrew, church government, logic, civics, biblical studies, and Bible doctrines. After Prescott had confessed his opposition to Jones and Wagner in December of 1888, he sought to give them more opportunities to present the message laid upon their hearts. But when a surprising 157 ministerial students showed up for the ministerial institute, representing nearly half the entire Adventist ministerial workforce, Dan Jones could not help but be distressed. There was a great possibility that whatever Wagner presented in his classes would have a noticeable effect upon Adventist thinking and its worldwide work. Upon hearing of Wagner's plans to begin teaching on the subject of the Covenants Monday morning, January 20, Dan Jones decided to go and have a talk with Brother White and Dr. Wagner in reference to the matter. He wished to prevail on them to lay over that question at least until Professor Prescott and Elder Olson returned to campus. Rather than talk with Wagner first, Dan Jones went to W.C. White and told him how he felt. But White would not commit himself, telling Jones to go to talk with Dr. Wagner himself. Finally, Late Friday evening, January 17, Dan Jones went and talked with Wagner for almost two hours. But Wagner was firm in his decision to go on with the work he had laid out for the class. So far, Jones's efforts were in vain. Not one to give up easily, Dan Jones went Sabbath morning to have a talk with Ellen White. According to him, after he laid the matter before her and told her how he felt about it, she expressed the thought that the question ought to be investigated by the leading brethren before it was brought up in the school. Dan Jones told Eldon White that he had attempted this very thing, but that Wagner was disinclined to make any change in his plan. Ellen White suggested again, according to Jones, that the brethren get together with Wagner first before the classes started on Monday. Dan Jones now went back to Wagner and shared what Sister White had said. But one might rightly wonder how much of the story he really shared, for according to him, Wagner was immovable. Dan Jones then spoke to Wagner about having an investigation to which Wagner seemed perfectly willing. Wagner said he wanted both sides of the question fully brought out. At this, Dan Jones set about to schedule a meeting for Sunday evening with Uriah Smith, R.C. Porter, and several others. At seven o'clock Sunday evening, in the general conference room, a meeting was held with Wagner to investigate the covenant question. Dan Jones was elected chairman of the meeting, which turned out to be more of an interrogation session than an investigation. After stating what the object of the meeting was, Joan asked how they should proceed. Smith suggested that we take up the points of difference in the covenant question and consider them. Because Dan Jones was the one who had called the meeting, it was decided that he should state the points of difference. Quote, After thinking a moment, I said that if it was placed on me to state the points of difference, I could do no better than to take the Sabbath school lessons and refer to some points that were made in them which were questionable to my mind, and I thought they were questionable to the minds of others present. So I commence with note one on page 11 the first sentence of which reads as follows, quote, Let the student note 
that the terms of the Old Covenant were really all on the part of the people, close quote. I told him that I could not agree with that statement and asked if all the others present agreed with it. Brother Smith said that he did not. Brother Porter also dissented. I asked Brother Smith's reason for disagreeing. He read Deuteronomy 26, 17 to 19, and asked if that referred to the Old Covenant. No one answered, but Brother White raised the question as to what it took to constitute a covenant whether we should take Webster's definition or not. Brother Smith again very quietly asked if the verses he had read referred to the Old Covenant. Another question was raised. When that was over, Brother Smith again asked if the verses that he had read referred to the Old Covenant. Dr. Wagner then said that he objected to that way of investigating the covenant question said that he did not understand that he had come to this meeting to have the Sabbath school lessons picked to pieces, but to investigate the covenant question. And he did not think it could be satisfactorily investigated in that way. He went on at some length, stated that he had understood that all agreed with his position on the covenant question. He considered that the Review and Herald Publishing Board were committed to his position as they had accepted a reading which he had prepared on that subject and put it in the 1889 Bible readings in place of the one that was in the first edition of that book and had been circulating it by the tens of thousands everywhere. He also intimated very decidedly that Elder Smith had practically committed himself in favor of his position by publishing the Sabbath school lessons. Close quote. This is quoted from a letter that Dan T. Jones wrote to E. W. Farnsworth in February 9 of 1890. The biggest concern some of the brethren had was over Wagner's definition of the Old Covenant. However, Dan Jones read a few more points in the lessons where he considered there was differences of opinion. Quote, Then I stated what the object of the investigation was for, that Dr. Wagner had announced that he would take up the subject in the school next week, and that it seemed to me wrong to take up a controverted subject and teach it in a general conference school where there were members of the faculty and members of the managing board that did not agree with the doctrines taught. I did not think Wagner ought to bring anything into the school that they would not endorse or bring any new doctrine until he had consulted with them in reference to it. If they all thought it was the right thing for him to go on and teach the covenant question in the school as he had in the Sabbath school lessons, I would say nothing more about it, though I could not see the propriety of it. Brother Smith then said he would rather it would not be taught in the school. Dr. Wagner made the plea that he understood when he came here that he was to teach his own views and that he would not have come on any other condition, said that he did not want to come in the first place and only consented to teach when he was pressed to do so. Close quote, also quoted from a letter that Dan Jones wrote to Brother Farnsworth, February 9, 1890. At this point, Elder McCoy and Professor Miller both spoke rather favorably toward allowing the doctor to go on and teach the covenant question in the school, as it already had come out in the Sabbath school lessons. W.C. White also favored his doing so and referred to some things that he had heard his mother say that he interpreted to mean that it was right for him to do so. At this, Dan Jones unabashedly stated that it might be all right to do so, but I could not see the propriety of it and that as far as I was concerned, I wanted to put myself on record as opposed to its being done. This is also quoted from 
Dan Jones's letter to Brother Fonsworth, February 9, 1890. Footnote. So much for Dan Jones's statement shortly before that if all felt it was okay for Wagner to teach, he would say nothing more about it. Perhaps he was not aware that just like Minneapolis, the history of that meeting has passed into eternity with its burden of record, and when the judgment shall sit and the books shall be opened, there will be found registered a history that many who were at that meeting will not be pleased to meet. Close quote, Ellen White, Letter 67, September 17, 1890, found also in the 1880 materials, page 706. End of footnote. The meeting dragged on until midnight, when it was adjourned without coming to any decision. According to Dan Jones, everything passed off pleasantly. There was not a harsh or unkind word spoken, and I think not a hard feeling on the part of anyone. Apparently, Wagner did not feel the same. The very next day, he turned in his resignation for that class. Footnote. In Dan Jones's mind, only brotherly kindness was shown at the meeting. Ellen White exposed his concept as false. Quote, Some may say, I do not hate my brother. I am not so bad as that. But how little they understand their own hearts. They may think they have a zeal for God in their feelings against their brother if his ideas seem in any way to conflict with theirs. Feelings are brought to the surface that have no kinship with love. They show no disposition to harmonize with him. They would as gladly be at Swartz Point with their brother as not. And yet he may be bearing a message from God to the people, just the light they need for this time. Close quote, 188 Materials, page 1022, and footnote. Wagner's resignation created a problem that Dan Jones had not thought about. Who would teach that class period for all the students at the ministerial school? Jones set out to try to make satisfactory arrangement with W.C. White and Wagner to cover the class period. But Jones stated, I could not see my way clear to give up the principle that seemed to me to be so just and right and give my consent for Wagner's views to be presented in the school. It is no wonder with Dan Jones's attitude that Wagner refused to teach the class. White suggested that Uriah Smith be asked to take the class since the doctor was doing too much anyway and needed more time for his editorial work and rest. Smith agreed to take the class, and Dan Jones arranged to make a smooth matter of it before the class by stating that it had been thought best for Brother Smith to come in for the present, as Dr. Wagner was overworked and needed rest. A few minutes before Wagner closed his first class period, Dan Jones arrived with Uriah Smith to give his announcement. Later, he described what took place. Quote, After Wagner had closed, he said, Sometimes the unexpected happens, and something very unexpected has happened to me. There have been objections made to my teaching the covenant question in this school, very much to my surprise, and I will not take it up for the present. Brother Dan Jones will explain to you the change that has been made. Close quote. That upset my little speech completely that I had fixed up to make, so I could only say that it had been thought best to postpone the presentation of the covenant question for the present at least. Close quote. Wagner had unwittingly exposed Dan Jones's questionable dealings. For the time being, though, the covenant question was on hold. Some of the students were not at all pleased at being deprived of the instruction 
of Brother Wagner. The very next day, one student wrote to O.A. Olson, General Conference President and School Board member, expressing his thoughts that he was hoping that we might have a candid investigation of the covenant question. It would be several weeks before that request was granted. In the meantime, opposition to both E.J. Wagner and A.T. Jones grew increasingly bold. The discrediting of God's messengers. Dan Jones did not stop after he effectively terminated Wagner's presentations on the covenants. During the days and weeks ahead, he was in continual correspondence with other leaders across the country, sharing with them his prejudices. To receive such a letter from the Secretary of the General Conference and member of the Executive Committee was of no small consequence. Only three days after Wagner resigned his class, Dan Jones sent off a letter to AWLE, a church leader in Missouri, giving him counsel for an upcoming institute to be held in that state. Quote, I think an institute in Missouri would be a splendid thing, but I believe an institute on a quiet plan would be just as valuable to you as to make a great parade over it and get in Elder A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner. To tell you the truth, I do not have very much confidence in some of their ways of presenting things. They try to drive everything before them and will not admit that their position can possibly be subject to the least criticism. They say it is truth. All you need to do is study it as long as I have and you will see it. Footnote. This alleged statement by A.T. Jones was circulated by Uriah Smith and even interjected into a letter Smith wrote to Ellen White on February 17, 1890. Ellen White responded by writing to Jones and confronting him with the alleged statements. Jones responded to the allegations in a letter written to Ellen White and also had a chance to explain his side of the story at a minister's meeting held in the conference office. As a result, Ellen White wrote to Uriah Smith stating that he had accused Jones wrongfully. You find this in the 88 materials, page 734, continuing the footnote. The damage has been done, however. It is much easier to start a rumor than it is to stop one. In a letter to Uriah Smith, Ellen White explained how this happened. Quote, You have strengthened the hands and minds of such men as Larson, Porter, Dan Jones, Eldridge, and Morrison, and Nicola, and a vast number through them. All quote you, and the enemy of righteousness looks on pleased. Close quote. 1888 Materials. Page 599, end of footnote. Continuing the quote from Dan Jones. And simply laugh at any ideas that may be presented by others that will disagree in the least with their own. But our more thoughtful men, Brother Smith, Brother Littlejohn, Brother Corliss, Brother Gage, and others do not agree with them on many positions which they take on national reform and on some theological questions like the covenants, the law in Galatians, etc. But these things they make prominent wherever they go, and in fact, do not dwell upon any other subject scarcely than those upon which there is a difference of opinion among our leading brethren. I do not think you want to bring that spirit into the Missouri Conference. If you could get Brother Gates and Brother Farnsworth, and have a ministerial institute for the study of the Bible and of plans of work, and then depend largely upon yourselves to dig out the principles of truth and plans adapted to your work in Missouri, it would be worth more to you than a highfalutin theory that never has worked and never will work anywhere. Close quote. This is how 
Dan Jones used his influence in an underhanded way to keep what he called a highfalutin theory from going any farther than it had. He was not the only one that was sharing his opinions openly. Uriah Smith, feeling that Wagner's temporary resignation was not enough to stop the progress of his false theories, wrote a disclaimer in the review. He made it clear that he did not support the current Sabbath school lessons with Wagner's view of the covenants. Quote, to many inquirers who are writing us concerning the new theological departure in the Sabbath school lessons, we would say that according to the professions we make, the Bible and the Bible alone is our only rule of faith and practice, and any of you presented should be tested and decided by that word. None need feel bound to accept any doctrine simply because it appears in the Sabbath school lessons or review. The lessons are sent out under the auspices of the General Conference Sabbath School Association, and it is not necessary to be understood that the review in any acting part and spreading them before the people endorses all that they may contain, especially in view of the fact that when it was decided by the Review and Herald Board to open a Sabbath school department in the Review and publish the lessons therein, it was not known what the lessons would be. It would, of course, be greatly be desired that all propositions advanced should be such as would commend themselves to the acceptance of all thoughtful Bible students as in accordance with both reason and scripture. But if in any case they do not seem to be such, it is not only the privilege, but the duty of those who detect their disagreement with the scriptures to reject them without scruple and without reserve. Close quote. Quoted from Uriah Smith, Review and Herald, January 28, 1890. Uriah Smith called on all to take the Bible and the Bible alone as their rule of faith. He stated this ever so sincerely, feeling that the Bible supported his positions and refuted the new theological departure of Wagner's Sabbath school lessons. Footnote. This point cannot be missed. The opponents of Jones and Wagner were claiming the Bible and the Bible only as the rule of faith. This was exactly what the scribes and Pharisees had done with Christ, quoting from the books of Moses to prove that they were right and he was wrong. Yet Jones and Wagner had come with a message that called people back to the Bible and to the beautiful truths found in its pages. Ellen White supported this approach, and in answer to those opposing Jones and Wagner, invited them back numerous times to study the scriptures that they might believe what was being presented. But her calls to a deeper study of the scriptures do not invalidate her statements of support for what Jones and Wagner were teaching from the scriptures. Would it not seem a little strange for the Lord in his great mercy to send a most precious message through elders Wagner and Jones that included a call for deeper Bible study if what they presented as a result of their deeper Bible study was in fact full of fatal errors? This is, however, exactly the type of accusations that were being leveled against them over 120 years ago. The leading brethren claimed to believe in the Bible and the doctrine of justification by faith. They just didn't believe in Jones and Wagner's new theological departure. This same mindset is alive today among those who disagree with Jones and Wagner in regard to the nature of Christ, righteousness by faith, the final generation, the latter reign, and the covenants. George Knight states, quote, The church needs to read the Bible through the eyes of Moses, John, Paul, and other Bible writers 
rather than through the eyes of any other source. Some today would have us read the Bible through the eyes of Jones and Wagner. Such a practice may be the most perilous mistake. Ellen White upheld both men because they were leading Adventists back to Christ and the Bible, not because they had the final word on theology or even had a theology with which she fully agreed. Close quote. A user-friendly guide, page 179. But Ellen White also warned of the subtle deception that was unsettling people's faith in the spirit of prophecy, brought about by the very men that were fighting against the message sent through Jones and Wagner, while they were claiming to uphold the Bible themselves. Quote, The enemy has made his masterly efforts to unsettle the faith of our people in the testimonies. And when these errors come in, they claim to prove all the promises by the Bible, but they misinterpret the scriptures. This is just as Satan designed it should be. And those who have been preparing the way for the people to pay no heed to the warnings and reproofs of the testimonies of the Spirit of God will see that a tide of errors of all kinds will spring into life. Close quote. Ellen White, in a letter to W.C. White in December of 1890, also found in the 1880 materials, page 739, close footnote. Ellen White would soon answer such premises, but it would not be until after Wagner was given a chance to present the covenants during the latter part of February. The decision to let him present the subject was left hanging until Ole A. Olson and W. W. Prescott returned to Battle Creek. In the meantime, Wagner continued to teach several classes at the Ministerial Institute. His underlining theme remained the same, justification by faith and the righteousness of Christ. Unfortunately, this did nothing to stop the controversy already brewing. Responsibility resting on the leadership. As Ellen White saw tension growing at the Ministerial Institute over the issue of the covenants, she feared the Minneapolis episode was about to be repeated. She began to attend many of the meetings, speaking every day for three weeks with but one or two exceptions. As was the case with the law in Galatians' question, the real issue at the heart of the covenant question was how the law and the gospel combined, how mankind is saved. A failure to have a clear understanding on this point would affect one's entire Christian experience and bring confusion into the work. The responsibility for the poor condition of the churches rested upon the ministers who were to break the bread of life to their congregations. The whole purpose of the ministerial institute was to better equip the ministers to fulfill their God-given responsibilities. With nearly half the church's laborers gathered in Battle Creek, Ellen White realized the great possibilities if everyone went forth from the institute, truly converted, and with the message of Christ's righteousness. She also realized that Satan was seeking to prevent such a thing from happening. Quote, I am convinced that Satan saw that there was very much at stake here and he did not want to lose his hold on our ministering brethren. And if the full victory comes, there will go forth from this meeting many ministers with an experience of the highest value. Close quote. 188 Materials, page 635. Ellen White was also led to realize the dire results if victory did not come, if the brethren refused to walk in the light shining upon their pathway. In her morning talks, Ellen White spoke decidedly against the prevailing spirit, even comparing her testimony with that of Moses in his farewell address. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, 
that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and thy seed may live. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. Truly, the decisions being made at the heart of the work would affect many generations to come. Her diary gives an account of what was taking place. Quote, I entreated them to search the scriptures for themselves. In the days of Christ, the scribes and Pharisees searched the Old Testament scriptures, but they interpreted what they read to sustain their traditions. Divided on most points, they were united on one point, opposition to Christ. And today, it seems that men have united to make of no effect the message that the Lord has sent. They change the meaning of God's word to suit their own opinions. God has a controversy with those who rest the scriptures, making them conform to their preconceived ideas, close quote. It was in this context that she warned the brethren, standing in positions of responsibility, not to grieve the spirit of God away from their hearts. She said, do not turn away from the messages that God sends as you did at Minneapolis. With an aching heart, she could ask, quote, why do they not arise and shine? Because their light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon them. Quoted from 188 Materials, pages 570 to 575. On February 3, Ellen White stood before the brethren and pleaded with them to accept the light that was being presented to them. She knew that there had been efforts, a contrary influence, to throw back the light, the light which God has been forcing in here upon us in regard to the righteousness of Christ. She could unabashedly state, quote, If God has ever spoken by me, it is the truth, brethren. It is the truth that every soul of you will receive or your soul will be left in darkness as barren as the hills of Gilboa. God was giving them precious opportunities. Quote, Now I want to say, brethren, there is an open door and no man can close it to you no matter whether it is those in the highest position or lowest position. They cannot close it, but you can. You can close the door of your heart that the light which God has sent you for the last year and a half, or nearly that, shall not have its influence and its effect upon your life, nor be brought into your religious experience. This is what God sends his messengers for. 1888 Materials, pages 537 and 538. She reminded the brethren that after John the Baptist had come with a message that agitated and stirred the hearts of his listeners, Christ came in with a healing balm, a message which, with the heart broken up, the seed could fall into prepared soil. Yet John's disciples became jealous of Christ. In the same manner, she continued, God has workmen. They carry the work so far, and they can carry it no further. Now God calls upon another workman to come right in and advance that work. The one that was working becomes circumscribed. He cannot see that the very line of work that he is working in is not to be pursued to the very close of time. There has to be more light and power infused into the work than we have had. 1888 Materials, pages 539 and 540. Footnote. Ellen White's comments to this point must be understood in the light of her next statements. She was likely referring to the work that even her husband had done. A promise kept. As Ellen White continued her discourse, she carried her listeners back in time past the previous year's many camp meetings, past the 1888 Minneapolis Conference with all its conflict, all the way back to the time 
when she sat at the side of her dying husband in 1881. It was here, she recalled, that God had made a promise, quote, this work is to be carried upward and forward, and the building is to go up. Thus God has worked with his workmen. He buried the workmen, but the work progresses still. While I sat with the hand of my dying husband in my own, I knew that God was at work. While I sat there on the bed by his side, he in such feverness, it was there like a clear chain of light presented before me. The workmen are buried, but the work shall go on. I have workmen that shall take hold of this work. Fear not, be not discouraged, it shall go forward. It was there I understood that I was to take the work and a burden stronger than I had ever borne before. It was there I promised the Lord that I would stand at my post of duty, and I have tried to do it. I do as far as possible the work that God has given me to do with the understanding that God was to bring on an element in this work that we have not had yet. Close quote. 1888 Materials, page 540. Footnote. When Ellen White edited this sermon for the Review and Herald, she rephrased this last sentence to read, quote, He would bring a large measure of his Holy Spirit into the work. Close quote. Review and Herald, March 18, 1890, 1888 Materials, page 545. There was no question in Ellen White's mind that God had fulfilled his promise. He had not only miraculously healed her less than a year after her husband's death as she lay a candidate for the grave, but God had also given Wagner his divine calling only a few days later while Ellen White spoke at the Hillsborough camp meeting during the fall of 1882. Not long after, God again fulfilled his promise by calling A.T. Jones, to join in the expanding work. Now, in the year 1890, according to Alan White, their message had brought an element in this work that we have not had yet. Immediately, after speaking of her husband's death, Ellen White reminded her listeners how those in responsible positions were treating the new light of that message which God had promised to send. What were the results of the meetings that had been held that previous summer when she stood side by side with God's chosen messengers? Quote, Our young men look at the older men that stand still as a stick and will not move to accept any new light that is brought in. They, younger men, will laugh and ridicule what these men say, Jones and Wagner, and what they do as of no consequence. Who carries the burden of that laugh and of that contempt, I ask you? It is the very ones that have interposed themselves between the light that God has given that it shall not go to the people who should have it. Now, brethren, I say, clear the king's highway for your soul's sake. If you have interposed between the people and the light, get out of the way or God will move you out of the way. Now it is just exactly as in the days of the Jews. When a message came in, why all the power of the leaders was put against it that it should not have access to the people. If God sends us light, let it come to us and let no man close the door or try to close it. Don't close it yourselves. Open the door of your heart and let the brilliant rays of light shine into your heart and into your mind. I pray you, let the sun of righteousness in. How long is the grace of God to come to this people in vain? I plead with you for Christ's sake. Clear the king's highway and trifle not with the Spirit of God. 
we have traveled all through to the different places of the meetings that I might stand side by side with the messengers of God that I knew were his messengers, that I knew had a message for his people. I gave my message with them right in harmony with the very message they were bearing. What did we see? We saw a power attending the message. I tried to present it to you, that you may see the evidence that I saw. But it seems that the words go into empty air. How long is it to be thus? How long will the people at the heart of the work hold themselves against God? Close quote, 188 Materials, pages 540 to 543. Ellen White could not have made it clearer. The young men who laughed and ridiculed the message presented by Jones and Wagner were doing so as a result of the example set by the older men in leadership positions. Consequently, it was the older men who would carry the burden of that laugh. Yes, the older men as individuals were committing sin, but the effects of their sins were far-reaching in their influence. Ellen White was warning them against following in the steps of the Jewish leaders. The results would be fearful. Footnote, quote, For the rejection of Christ, with the results that followed, they, the scribes and Pharisees, were responsible. A nation's sin and a nation's ruin were due to the religious leaders. Close quote. Ellen White, Christ Object Lessons, page 305. Could the same principle hold true today? This gives no license to laity nor to offshoot groups that point to the church as Babylon. But it does show the awesome responsibility that leadership carries. And is one good reason we should uphold and join those in leadership positions in seeking the Lord. Close footnote. When Ellen White published her morning talk, a few weeks later, in the review, she added several paragraphs reaffirming her support for Jones and Wagner and the very message as it has been presented. She admonished those standing in the way, quote, How long will it be before you will believe the testimonies of God's Spirit? When is the truth for this time to find access to your hearts? Will you wait till Christ comes? How long will God permit the way to be hedged up? Clear the king's highway, I beseech you, and make his paths straight. I have traveled from place to place, attending meetings where the message of the righteousness of Christ was preached. I considered it a privilege to stand by the side of my brethren and give my testimony with the message for the time. And I saw that power attended the message wherever it was spoken. You could not make the people believe in South Lancaster that it was not a message of light that came to them. The people confessed their sins and appropriated the righteousness of Christ. God has set his hand to do this work. We labored in Chicago. It was a week before there was a break in the meetings. But like a wave of glory, the blessing of God swept over us as we pointed men to the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. The Lord revealed His glory, and we felt the deep movings of His Spirit. Everywhere the message led to the confession of sin and to the putting away of iniquity. Suppose you blot out the testimony that has been going during these last two years proclaiming the righteousness of Christ. Who can you point to as bringing out special light for the people? This message, as it has been presented, should go to every church that claims to believe the truth and bring our people up to a higher standpoint. Every worker has his place. 
But God does not want any man to think that no other message is to be heard but that which he may have given. We want the past message and the fresh message. Close quote. Review and Herald, March 18, 1890. 1888 Materials, page 545. On Wednesday, February 5, Ellen White spoke once again to those gathered at the meetings in Battle Creek. She pled with the brethren to draw nigh to God and to one another. She tried to encourage them that God was seeking to bless them with light flashing from the throne of God that the people might be able to stand in the day of God. Churches were ready to die due to a lack of spiritual food. The ministers were to present to these churches truths not from another man's brain, but from the light you have received by diligent search of the word of God. She encouraged her listeners once again with the wonderful results in South Lancaster, where she had worked alongside A.T. Jones in sharing this message. Quote, Nearly every student was swept in by the heavenly current, and living testimonies were given that were not surpassed even by the testimonies of 1844 before the disappointment. Many learned at South Lancaster what it meant to surrender their hearts to God, what it meant to be converted. Many said, I have for years professed to be a follower of Jesus, but I never knew before what it meant to know Jesus or the Father. I have learned from this experience what it means to be a Christian. Brethren, there is light for us. There is light for the people of God, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. The reason men do not understand is because they fasten themselves in a position of questioning and doubt. They do not cultivate faith. If God gives light, you must walk in the light and follow the light. Light is flashing from the throne of God. And what is this for? It is that a people may be prepared to stand in the day of God. Close quote, Review and Herald, March 4, 1890. Notwithstanding these events, the brethren still cautioned others not to attend classes given by Jones and Wagner, and some attended only to ask questions for the sake of discrediting their presentations. See 1888 materials, pages 549 and 555. Ellen White warned them that it was too late in the day to cry out against men for manifesting too much earnestness in the service of God to say, you are excited, you are too intense, too positive. It is too late to caution your brethren in studying the Bible for themselves for fear they may be deceived by error. She felt a great sense of urgency to warn the brethren against repeating the mistake of the Jews. Quote, I am writing on the life of Christ, the desire of ages. I lift up my heart in prayer to God that light may come to his people. As I see something of the loveliness of Christ, my heart ascends to God. Oh, let this glory be revealed to thy servants. Let prejudice and unbelief vanish from their hearts. Every line I trace about the condition of the people in the time of Christ, about their attitude toward the light of the world, in which I see danger that we shall take the same position, I offer up a prayer to God, O oh, let not this be the condition of thy people, forbid that thy people shall make this mistake. Increase their faith. We shall have to meet unbelief in every form in the world. But it is when we meet unbelief in those who should be leaders of the people that our souls are wounded. This is that which grieves us, and that which grieves the Spirit of God. Close quote. Review and Herald, 
February 5th, 1890, March 4th, 1890, pages 129 and 130. Footnote. All the while Ellen White was writing material for The Desire of Ages from 1890 through 1898, she was impressed with the parallels between the leaders of the Jewish nation and that of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Quote, Over 100 times, close quote, she gave warning that we not repeat the mistake of the Jews. When reading The Desire of Ages with this in mind, one can readily see the parallels in which Ellen G. White, 1888 Materials, parentheses, Ellen White's Hidden Message in the Desire of Ages, 1888 Message Newsletter, January, February, 1997, pages 3 to 5, close parentheses. It is also interesting to note what Ellen White penned in her diary the day she gave this morning talk, quote, I attended the early morning meeting. We had a good social meeting, and I then bore a decided testimony. How earnestly I am moved by the Spirit of God. Before I stand on my feet, I have no thought of speaking as plainly as I do, but the Spirit of God rests upon me with power, and I cannot but speak the words given me. I dare not withhold one word of the testimony. If the solemn call to repentance is not heeded, if false statements are made in regard to it, I may be cast down. I may feel sad, but I have no retraction to make. I speak the words given me by a power higher than human power, and I cannot, if I would, recall one sentence. In the night season, the Lord gives me instruction in symbols and then explains their meaning. He gives me the word, and I dare not refuse to give it to the people. The love of Christ, and I venture to add, the love of souls constrains me, and I cannot hold my peace. If evil is done by the word spoken, it is because those to whom the message is given have no place in their hearts for the word of God. Close quote, 1888 Materials, pages 578 and 579. Close footnote. The Holy Spirit was being graved away by the unbelief of those primarily in leadership positions. They were blocking the light from coming to the people, and their influence was affecting the entire church. The very next morning when Ellen White spoke to the leading brethren, she wondered why a good many men, including Uriah Smith, were not attending the meetings. Was it for fear they would be won? They were staying away and all the time firing in the dark against Jones and Wagner. She stated that the ministers should understand where the Spirit of God is, that they might know the impressions that the Lord is making upon his people. These were, Ellen White stated, the very men that ought to be here to feel their interest of having the truth for their positions of trust to be fitting for these positions, but they are not here at all. They do not come near. Instead of quibbling and trying to find hooks on which to hang their doubts, these ministers needed to go to their knees in prayer for Christ's sake to see the error and mistake of the Jews. Quoted from 1888 Materials, pages 549 and 555. Ellen White told of how she awoke the morning before with such a heavy burden. She felt a responsibility knowing that men were not walking in the light. She entreated the brethren, When you go from this place, oh, be so full of the message that it is like fire shut up in your bones that you cannot hold your peace. It is true, men will say, you are too excited. You are making too much of this matter. And you do not think enough of the law. Now you must think more of the law. Don't be all the time reaching for this righteousness of Christ, but build up the law. Let the law take care of itself. We have been at work on the law until we get as dry as the hills of Gilboa without dew or rain. Let us trust in the merits of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, 
Would they heed the admonition? The following morning, Ellen White continued along the same lines. The brethren were making a mistake in considering men infallible. The people were looking to the ministers to take care of them as if they had no personal work to do themselves. But regardless of a man's position, whether he was an old leader in the work or a newcomer, the people were to study the Bible for themselves to see what was truth. The people were to put their trust in God and not man, for there are not any of us infallible. Footnote. We must be clear that there are not any of us infallible, including Jones and Wagner. They did make mistakes and had some incorrect views in their theological understanding, which Ellen White corrected. Yet, we must be careful that we do not continue the same rebellion in which the leading brethren participated in by rejecting Ellen White's counsel and by always seeking to find hooks on which to hang our doubts in regard to the most precious message. In 1892, Ellen White stated, It is quite possible that Elder Jones or Wagner may be overthrown by the temptations of the enemy, but if they should be, this would not prove that they had had no message from God or that the work that they had done was all a mistake. But should this happen, how many would take this position and enter into a fatal delusion because they are not under the control of the Spirit of God? They walk in the sparks of their own kindling and cannot distinguish between the fire they have kindled and the light which God has given, and they walk in blindness as did the Jews. This is found in 188 Materials, pages 1044 and 1045. Sadly, both Jones and Wagner made mistakes after 1892, and both were overthrown by the temptations of the enemy after the turn of the century. But the important point for us to remember today is that we do not enter into a fatal delusion as Ellen White predicted would happen and through our teaching and writing make 1888 history fit a new theology. Close footnote. But the fallibility of man did not negate the fact that God had more light for his people which was to be given through his appointed messengers. Quote, there is power for this people, I know it. God has been revealing it to me for years, and the time has come. We want to know that that living faith should be inspired in our hearts and that we shall be reaching out for more light and more knowledge. Close quote. 1888 Materials, pages 562 and 564. Ellen White was not called to be a prophet who settled every difference of opinion, telling people what they must or must not believe. She had not been the easy way out in the past, neither would she be the easy way out during the conflict over the covenants. In the early days, when the pioneers discovered truths about the Sabbath and the heavenly sanctuary, the Lord confirmed these truths through Ellen White's prophetic gift only after they had earnestly studied the Bible. This would also be the case with the law in Galatians and the covenants. The Lord did not reveal all the light on these points of controversy at once. As Ellen White saw opposition rising against that light, she pointed the people to the Bible. The purpose of such study was not only to determine if what Jones and Wagner presented was truth, it was also to lead the people to a personal experience in that truth. The church was already dealing with the lukewarm results of a mere mental assent to a list of creedal truths, justification by faith being one of them. Furthermore, Ellen White's authority as a prophet of God was being greatly questioned by many church leaders because she supported Jones and Wagner and the message they presented. She knew that if the people would go to the Bible for themselves, 
they would see that God was indeed sending showers of blessings upon his church. Quote, now here you are in this school. Brother Wagner may present the truth before you. You may say that the matter that he presents is truth, but then what will you do? You must go to the scriptures for yourselves. You must search them with humble hearts. If you are just full of prejudice and your own preconceived opinions, and if you entertain the idea that there is nothing for you to know, and that you know all that is worth knowing, you will not get any benefit here. But if you come like children, you want to learn all there is for you. The Lord of heaven has led the mind of man to make a specialty of studying the scripture, and when those scriptures are presented, he has given us reasoning powers to see the evidence just as well as he, the presenter, can see it. I can find the evidence as he finds it. I can go out and speak the truth because I know it is the truth. I believe without a doubt that God has given precious truth at the right time to Brother Jones and Brother Wagner. Do I place them as infallible? Do I say that they will not make a statement or have an idea that cannot be questioned or that cannot be air? Did I say so? No, I do not say any such thing. Nor do I say that of any man in the world. But I do say, God has sent light. And do be careful how you treat it. Close quote. 1888 Materials, pages 562 to 567. At that particular point in time, the Lord had not specifically revealed to Ellen White that Jones and Wagner's positions on the covenants was correct. He had, however, made it clear that he was sending light and precious truth, howbeit through fallible men. The important question was not whether Jones and Wagner were infallible, but how the brethren were treating the light that God had sent. Instead of looking for flaws in the messengers and the message, they were to study as if looking for light. Instead of telling the people to stay away from the meetings, they were to encourage investigation. Quote, I speak of these men, ministers, that they may know, that they may understand what is truth. And if they will not hear, if they will keep away, just as the ministers tell the congregations, the stay away argument, don't go to hear. Now, you want to hear everything. If he, Wagner, has got air, we want to know it. We want to understand it. And then we want to investigate for ourselves. We want to know that it is truth. And if it is truth, brethren, those children in the Sabbath school class want it. And every soul of them need it. Those that are in responsible positions, I say, you are under obligation to God to know what is going on here. This has given me such a sadness and grief to know that there are those who have just had their hearts filled with prejudice. And they listen for every word they can catch. Who says they, Jones and Wagner, are perfect? Who claims it? We claim God has given us light in the right time. And now we should receive the truth of God, receive it as of heavenly origin. When a point is proven, Oh, they, the brethren, will not acknowledge a word. Why, they see no light, but pour it in, question after question. Well, not one point is settled. They do not acknowledge that they have met that point, but pour in a whole list of questions. Now, brethren, we want to know what it is to examine the Scriptures as those who want light, and not those who want to shut out the light. Close quote. 188 Materials, 566 and 567. Such was the state of things at the Ministerial Institute before Wagner even had an opportunity to present on the two covenants. An environment was set in place conducive to rejecting 
all the light that God was seeking to pour upon his people. Those gathered there were ministers and leaders in the church. And although their acceptance or rejection of the light sent from heaven was an individual choice, the consequences would affect the entire church. Their sin would be a nation's sin like that of the Jews. Men had become guideposts pointing in the wrong direction. For their sins, the whole church stands accountable. This is quoted from the 1888 materials, pages 916 and 764. Footnote. A look through the first two volumes of Ellen G. White's 1888 materials explains how this could be the case. The people were looking in a large degree to men they have set up before them in the place of God. They were following their example far more than they have looked to God and sought his counsel. Ellen White described this putting man where God should be as idolatry. The brethren could never lead the people to an experience of which they were not partakers. The people would go no farther than you will go. The brethren were to respect the light God had given, not only for their own safety, but also for the safety of the church of God. When Uriah Smith rejected the message of Jones and Wagner, he became the stumbling block of many others. He strengthened the hands and minds of such men as Larson, Porter, Dan Jones, Eldridge, and Morrison, and Nicola, and a vast number through them. He had quite a number fully engaged with him in the work, men in responsible positions, presidents of conferences, ministers and workers that formed a confederacy to question, to criticize. The position these men have occupied and the influence this position has given them has caused many to doubt who will never be settled again and the deceptions and delusions of these last days will overcome them, for they have decided from the example given them. These representative men, walking in darkness, could not discern light from heaven, which was affecting the whole tenor of their thoughts, their decisions, their propositions, their counsels. Yet Ellen White stated, Elder Smith is placed in positions as teacher to mold and fashion the minds of students when it is well known fact that he is not standing in the light. Ellen White realized that the work was being swayed in wrong lines. The position and work of elders Butler, Farnsworth, Smith, and numerous others is to unsettle the faith of the people of God by things which they say but which they ought not to say, and things left unsaid which they ought to say. In this state of things, unbelief, prejudice, and Phariseeism is leavening the church. The spirit manifested at Battle Creek has been the spirit in many churches. As a result, sinners in our borders have become hardened and have been fearfully established in unbelief. Because Alan White supported the Bible truth presented by Jones and Wagner from the source which the Lord chose to send it, these men in prominent positions doubted her calling. They were scattering the seeds of doubt and unsettling the confidence of the churches in the testimonies. Ellen White stated, I hear everywhere I go objections to the testimonies, quoting Elder Smith and Butler. Those who have been reproved fasten upon this doubting, unbelieving position of our leading men and feel at liberty to say the testimonies given for them were not true. As a result, the blood of other souls would rest upon those who have been blinded by the enemy. Ellen White could rightly ask, Shall we repeat the history of the Jews in our work? had the common people of the Jewish nation been allowed to receive his message, they would have not rejected Jesus. Yet, she stated, the leaders of the people of today pursue the same course of action that the Jews pursued. As a result, 
God withholds his spirit from them and darkness envelops them as it did the Jewish nation. The men in responsible positions have disappointed Jesus. The spirit of God is grieved, but they are so dull of comprehension that they know it not. It is no wonder that Ellen White stated that unless these evils which bring the displeasure of God are corrected, the whole church stands accountable for them. 